Hello, and welcome to today's ACM 6 Off webinar. This webcast is part of ACM 6 Off's commitment to provide value to its current and future members. The ACM 6 Off webinar series features speakers from the future of software engineering track at the International Conference of Software Engineering, as well as select keynote speakers and distinguished paper authors. I am Robert Dyer, Assistant Professor at Bowling Green State University, and it is my pleasure to welcome you today. Before we get started, I'd like to quickly mention a few housekeeping items shown on the slide in front of you. First, the slides will advance automatically throughout the event. On the bottom panel, you will find a number of additional widgets and resources. If you're experiencing problems with the slides or your audio, press the F5 key in Windows, Command-R if you're on a Mac, or refresh your browser on a mobile device. Or you can close and relaunch the presentation. To control the volume, adjust the master volume on your computer. At the end of our presentation, we will have time for questions. Please type your question into the Q&A box at any time during the webinar, and then click the Submit button. This session is being recorded and will be archived. You will receive an automatic email notification when it becomes available. Today's presentation is Towards Next Generation Software Infrastructure for Crisis Informatics Research. And today's talk is by Ken Anderson from the University of Colorado Boulder. Ken Anderson's research interests include hypermedia, design of reliable large-scale software infrastructures, design and implementation of data-intensive systems, and design of web application frameworks. Since 2009, he has co-directed the NSF-funded project EPIC that investigates how members of the public make use of social media during times of a mass emergency where he leads the design and implementation of EPIC's large-scale data collection and analysis system. Ken, we look forward to your presentation today. All right, thank you very much for that introduction, Robert, and thanks to Will Trace for inviting me to speak. My talk today is about the role that social media plays in society's response to mass emergency and the software that's needed to capture and analyze what happens during such events. This notion is something I've been studying alongside my collaborators since fall 2009, and something that my primary collaborator, Professor Leisha Palin, also at CU Boulder, has been studying since the spring of 2005, about three to six months before Hurricane Katrina struck the U.S. So let me just briefly introduce her, because uh, her work um, under, uh, you know, is the context in which my work occurs. So Professor Palin studies how members of the public make use of social media during mass emergency or mass convergence events. This is an area of study called crisis informatics. The term was coined by Christine Hagar when she studied the 2001 UK foot and mouth disease, uh, and, was a simple, it was, and a simple definition of this term is the study of how members of the public make use of social media during times of mass emergency. Crisis Informatics was then expanded by Professor Palin as she and her students looked at the use of information technology in events such as uh, Hurricane Katrina, the Virginia Tech shootings, the Red River floods, and the 2008 U.S. political conventions, as well as subsequent work performed by her current research project, which as Robert mentioned is called Project EPIC. So to perform research in crisis informatics, Professor Palin needs access to a large amount of data, Furthermore, she needs to define the research methodologies, methodologies that will define how she should approach that data and what questions she should ask of that data. And she needs software tools to apply those methodologies to extract the information she needs to answer those questions. Well, she develops those methodologies and comes up with those questions, and I, in turn, lead the design and implementation of the software tools that she makes use of. So today, I'd like to take you on a journey, uh, a software engineering journey, which will identify the architectural styles and software components that are needed to create a software infrastructure that supports crisis informatics research. And I'm going to share with you the journey that we took as we developed the infrastructure that we use today to collect hundreds of millions of data points. Uh, which in our world focuses on data almost exclusively from Twitter, 
Uh, I will then describe our current infrastructure and end with uh, the vision that we have for the, uh, the next generation of software infrastructure in crisis informatics research. So let's set the, set the stage. So just a little bit more about me. My name is Ken Anderson. I've been a professor of computer science for the last 17 years uh, with a long time interest in software infrastructure. Software infrastructure provides a set of services that can be used by a variety of tools to help users perform tasks. And my PhD work at UC Irvine in the 90s looked at how to develop hypermedia middleware that could provide hypermedia functionality to a wide range of applications. Today, we mainly use hypermedia in web browsers, but back in the 90s, in various research labs, you could use hypermedia in all of your applications. And I learned a lot uh, from designing that middleware, and have since generalized that work to provide services to a wide range of application domains. And as a result, my research questions focus on, sorry, focus on what software architectural styles are best to deliver infrastructure that is reliable, efficient, and scalable. And that's the focus of my research today. How do we make the collection analysis of social media data during times of crisis reliable, efficient, and scalable while tackling challenges of heterogeneity and timeliness? The systems that we produce belong to a class that is now referred to as data-intensive software systems. Uh, and it's part of a space that is, of course, called big data. Now, to me, big data is simply an extension of work that has gone on in many fields for a long time. Software engineering, distributed systems, networking, machine learning, and data analysis. But now at truly large scales in terms of the amount of data being processed, the number of users being supported, and the number of transactions per second being handled. In my own work, my, paper thus, my papers thus focus on issues of interest to the field of software engineering and crisis informatics is the domain that allows me to test and validate our approach uh, to the design of these systems. And I perform my work in the context of Project EPIC, which is a large NSF-funded project uh, that has received nearly $4 million to study crisis informatics in a variety of ways. My research has produced the software tools used by Project Epic to collect and analyze several billion tweets across hundreds of events since the fall of 2009. Uh, that data has been put to good use, producing nearly 70 refereed conference paper and journal publications, alongside seven PhD dissertations and several master's theses, and has led to positive impact on organizations like the Red Cross, as well as local and national emergency management groups in the U.S. Project EPIC stands for Empowering the Public with Information in Crisis, and it highlights the, at the time, unique approach to studying crisis by focusing on the role of the public in these events, rather than on the formal emergency response. Project EPIC currently consists of four faculty members and nine PhD students, uh, and we investigate everything from my work on infrastructure design to the use of maps and photos during crisis events, the differences in behavior between people local to an event and those who are monitoring from afar, the use of citizens as sensors during an event, and how formal emergency management has evolved since the use of social media by the public during disasters has become pervasive. And that's the key, that's the reason why we can even study this phenomenon, the pervasive use of technology by members of the public. And I have a photo here that I like to use to illustrate the change that our society has experienced in just the last 10 years. The, uh, here's a picture of people waiting in a plaza for the announcement of a new pope. And as you can see, down in the right-hand corner, there's just a single cell phone visible in this crowd. And this was just 10 years ago in 2005. Um, now, in that same plaza, just eight years later, uh, there was another announcement, and people gathered at the same plaza waiting uh, for, the, for, the new, uh, for the announcement of the latest pope. And in this photo, it's difficult to even find one person who does not have a device of some type, uh, which is just a fundamental transformation uh, that our society has gone, uh, undergone. And so what this means to us is that every person in a crisis event has the potential to become a reporter, to provide information, to correct information that has become stale, to post photos, and to respond to requests for information. Perhaps more importantly, this pervasive distribution of technology means that other people can respond to the event. They can converge digitally on the event 
and seek ways to help, to collaborate, and coordinate an informal response that sometimes may intersect with the formal response. And as an example, the 2010 Haiti earthquake led to the creation of two digital volunteer groups that operate to this day. Humanity Road is a grassroots organization that formed in the aftermath of Haiti to help people on the ground who had satellite phones stay online and to help publish good information far and wide. In addition, a website known as OpenStreetMap played a significant role in this event. Now, if you don't know, OpenStreetMap is known as the Wikipedia of maps. Anyone can log in and start editing map data at any time, and that map data aims to eventually cover the entire planet. And during the 2010 Haiti earthquake event, that led to the formation of a group, of a group known as the Humanitarian Open Street Map Team, or HOT for short. And this group came together during the Haiti event uh, to organize the work of 600 volunteers to take what was the then current map of Haiti, uh, here's the current map of uh, Port-au-Prince before that event, and in about three weeks' time, they coordinated uh, a completely volunteer effort to produce a map that looked like this. Uh, and it actually produced one of the most comprehensive, openly available maps of Port-au-Prince uh, at the end of that effort. And so these are the examples of the types of behaviors that we study. Humanity Road became an object of study as a result of finding the digital traces that its members left behind in the Twitter data that we collected during that emergency. And that's where I come in. How did we collect that data? And what do we have to do to create data sets large enough to provide the insight that's needed to find interesting digital behaviors surrounding a crisis event? Uh, in our study, our day-to-day -day focus is on events. When we learn of a new event of interest, we have our analysts search Twitter using tools like TweetDeck to examine how people are talking about the event. We will look for terms that will cast a wide net. That is, it will capture most tweets about the event, but it will also be noisy and we'll have to filter out non-related tweets later. For instance, using the search term Sandy during the 2012 Hurricane Sandy event, we'll collect tweets about the hurricane, but also tweets about people named Sandy. These terms are great for capturing the official tweets that are put out by news agencies, NGOs, and formal emergency management organizations, but not so great for capturing the tweets that are generated by locals. For that, we have our analysts look for regional terms, uh, place names and street names that might be mentioned by locals who are talking about the event. Uh, and we also try to find terms that are in the languages that are native to the area of impact to also uh, capture uh, tweets that are being generated by the locals. And this presents a challenge down the line during analysis since we'll need analysts who speak that language, uh, but sometimes locals will broadcast information in English uh, while including language-specific terms so that other locals can find it, and then we can analyze those tweets. After the initial set of tweets have been, uh, keywords have been identified, we continue to monitor Twitter, looking for terms of interest, and we make adjustments as time goes, goes on. And all of these terms are entered into what we call the Epic Event Editor, which in turn sends them to a piece of software that we call Epic Collect. It submits those terms to the Twitter streaming API, and I'll discuss Epic Collect uh, in a bit more detail uh, in, just a, in just a moment. Now, for high-frequency terms, the streaming API is sometimes capped by Twitter to just 1% of the total number of tweets being generated. For low-frequency terms, in our experience, you capture pretty much every tweet that's being generated despite Twitter's cap. However, we recently uh, worked with Twitter uh, to compare some of the, the data sets that we generated with the Twitter firehose, all the tweets that have ever been generated, and fortunately, the, the, the Twitter streaming a, API gets us really close to all tweets generated during the event, even with the 1% cap. Now, for each uh, uh, event, we also use a command line script to submit the same terms that we use uh, on the streaming API to the Twitter search API, and we'll search back in time for as many tweets that Twitter will return. For low frequency terms, the Twitter search API will usually go back about a month and give you all the tweets that contain that term. And that's often sufficient to capture all the tweets that you might have missed if an event started when we weren't, uh, you know, when we were asleep, for instance. Uh, for high frequency terms, you sometimes can go back only a few, few hours and not make it all the way back to the start of the event. 
although you can ask Twitter for popular tweets that will give you tweets that were the most retweeted and typically were generated towards the beginning of the event. So for Professor Palin and her research group, this represents a best effort attempt to capture a comprehensive data set, uh, even though in the Twitter search API you get uh, uh, orders of magnitude smaller data sets than you do from the streaming API. Now it is true that we could approach Twitter and purchase tweets that occurred during the window of time between when the event started and when we first started our own collection, but for our own research we did not want to assume any special relationship with Twitter and bulk purchases of Twitter data are very expensive outside the means of most research groups. Fortunately this is changing, uh, Twitter is becoming uh, much more open to uh, working with research groups and they're establishing a number of programs that make it uh, easier than ever to get, gain access to Twitter. And so this, uh, this aspect of Twitter data collection is starting to change. Now, in our, in our own work, I should just mention that a collection can be a long-term event. Eventually, the terms will settle down, and we can then leave those terms active for as long as it makes sense. And for some events, we shut the collection down after the response phase is over, but for other events, we let those terms run, sometimes for several years in order to capture discussions of long-term recovery activities and the discussions that occur at anniversaries, for instance. So here is a graph of our Twitter data collection of an event that involved a flood uh, uh, in one month, uh, in uh, you know, September of 2013, and then we were looking for spikes of activity when the anniversaries occurred a year or so later. All right, so all of these things are called uh, the keyword collection, because in each case we receive a tweet from Twitter because it contains one of the keywords specified by our analysts for that event. And this type of search can produce data sets consisting of hundreds of thousands to millions of tweets, depending on the size of the event and how long the collection runs. But it is not a comprehensive view uh, of the entire crisis event. To see why, we like to visualize the keyword collection in this way. Each tweet in this stream was handed to us by either the streaming API or the search API because it contained at least one of our keywords. But of course, each of these uh, tweets were generated by a user who was also generating other tweets. And um, yeah, it's just one of the many tweets that that user generated during the time of collection. Now for the vast majority of these Twitter users, they contribute just one tweet to the entire uh, data set. But other users will collect, uh, will generate many tweets uh, to the keyword data set, going in and out of their tweet stream, intersecting via the keywords that they use. And this is pretty typical. If you look at the contribution graph for most events, where you would show the number of tweets the user has generated on the y-axis and a unique Twitter user on the x-axis, this type of graph almost always follows a power law of some type, with a few users generating a huge number of tweets and then a very long tail of, of lots of users generating just a single tweet. But uh, the users who contribute multiple keywords uh, will, of course, appear multiple times in our keyword data set. But there are often lots of tweets that they generate during the time of collection that do not contain any of our keywords but are still about the event. And so we call these tweets contextual tweets. We thus perform what we call a contextual collection uh, for an event uh, as well. And sometimes we do that more than once because what we do is identify users of interest uh, and we might have multiple categories of interesting users. We use the Twitter REST API to collect all of the tweets that these users have ever generated. And now I like to say all, and that's true for most users, but for those users who tweet, tweet frequently, Twitter limits us to the last 3,200 tweets that they have generated. But that is a lot of tweets and it is with contextual collections that we generate truly large-scale Twitter data sets consisting of hundreds of millions of tweets. For instance, for Hurricane Sandy, our, our analysts identified uh, a set of 92,000 users of interest, and these were users who contributed at least one geolocated tweet on the eastern seaboard of the U.S. in the week before the landfall of the hurricane. And that's visualized here. Each of those yellow dots is a geolocated tweet. Um, I then conducted a data collection that downloaded all of the tweets of all of those users. So if they all had at least 3,200 tweets, I was looking at a total collection of 294.4 million tweets. Now what's nice about the Twitter API is that with its API rate limits, 
you can predict how long a data collection will take. To download a user's tweets, you make use of the Get Statuses User Timeline endpoint. You can make 180 requests on that endpoint every 15 minutes, receiving 200 tweets for each request, or about 720 requests per hour, and about 144,000 tweets per hour. In addition, it takes about 16 requests to download 3,200 tweets for a single user. So if you do the math, and believe me, I did, you get 294.4 million tweets divided by 144,000 tweets per hour, or about 2,044 hours, or about 85 days to use the Twitter REST API to collect all of those tweets. But the actual collection took only 12 days. So how did I do that? And that is through concurrency. The 85-day estimate is how long it would take for one script to do that collection. And in this particular case, I ran six uh, data collection scripts simultaneously. That reduced the estimate to 14 days, but since not every user has 3,200 tweets, and since some of the users have been deleted or have their accounts protected, it took only 12 days to uh, do that uh, data collection. Now, I don't have time to go into the details about writing the script uh, that does this type of collection, but it is very challenging. I use a style of design that I call design for interruption when creating this type of software. The software assumes that it's going to be interrupted all the time, network disconnects, rate limiting, Twitter service problems, etc. And then the goal is to do everything you can to make restarting the script if it fails brain dead simple and have it simply pick up where it left off. You do this because there's a human in the loop who's monitoring a collection that's lasting days or weeks at a time, and you want to make their life easier. So if you have to work extra hard to make sure your software handles every single error that you encounter so that it stays up and collects as close as possible to 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And this is a challenge uh, in crisis informatics uh, since these techniques and that type of design is often unfamiliar to most developers. Okay, with that as background, we're ready to look at the software infrastructure that we developed for Project Epic. There are three key concerns, data, collection, and analysis. For us, that means three pieces of software. Our, our data is, of course, tweets, and for our collection, we use uh, Epic Collect, and for our analysis, we use a system called Epic Analyze. But the first thing that you have to do when working in this space is to know your data. Today, this is somewhat easy to do for Twitter data. You can head to the URL I show here to see a beautifully formatted web page that lists 31 different attributes that can appear in a tweet. Back in the day, however, Twitter's documentation didn't look this good and wasn't as easy to find. One or more of those attributes can contain other tweet objects, such as when the tweet you're looking at is a retweet, and so it contains the original tweet embedded within it. And that subtweet also has almost that same set of 31 attributes, and so you have to be ready to process data that's across multiple layers, even within a single tweet. Another of those attributes is the user object, which itself has 41 different attributes, one of which is a copy of the most recent status, which is a tweet, generated by that user. So you have tweets containing users which contain tweets. Uh, and that status in turn contains an embedded user object which might set up what you would think is an infinite recursion, but instead has, uh, you have to write special case code uh, if you care to process this deep, since once you go down a few levels in this hierarchy, the types of attributes that show up are different and the types of data that they, show, uh, that they contain are different. And so you get very, very complex uh, very quickly, just even uh, a few layers down. Now, the challenges associated with Twitter data include a variety of issues beyond the complexity that I've even just hinted at. Tweets claim they're in UTF-8 format, but I've received tweets across the line that break JSON parsers because they contain non-UTF-8 character encodings. Uh, the 70-odd attributes that I've mentioned come and go at the will of Twitter. If you have historical data sets like we do, they contain attributes that are no longer generated today. In some cases, attributes are duplicated, as is the case with the geo and coordinates attribute. Geo is deprecated and is on its way out, but in the, in the meantime, if coordinates has a value, then geo does uh, too, but they're both formatted in different ways. In addition, some attributes have complex structures, such as the entities attribute, and that structure can and does change over time. And some attributes can contain multiple types of data. This, in this particular example, this no longer happens today, but it used to be the case that retweet count 
either have an integer if the tweet was, had been retweeted less than 100 times, but a string uh, saying 100 plus if it had been retweeted more than 100 times. And this value was used in the, the value used in the situation was 100 plus as shown here in a tweet in our data set of an event that happened in Norway back in 2011. So good luck writing code that has to test the types of the values of the attributes you care about to see which special case is being used for a given tweet. Now some attributes, an additional challenge is that some attributes are under a user's control and their values can and do change at a user's whim. For instance, a user can change their screen name whenever they want as long as the new name they pick is unique. I've seen the same user contribute tens of tweets to an event using 17 different screen names across the course of the event. And once you see that, you know that you can't rely on screen name to perform analysis that asks questions about users' behavior. You need to instead use the unique ID that Twitter generated for that user, uh, which doesn't change on a user's whim. If you go by screen name, you could be missing out on the complete behavior of your user. Finally, when using the streaming API, Twitter generates things called compliance messages that need to be honored. In particular, in many cases, if a user decides to delete a tweet, it usually happens within a very short span of time after the tweet has been generated. If you receive a tweet and then five minutes later receive a compliance message indicating the user deleted that tweet, you are bound by Twitter's terms of service to delete that tweet and not use it in your analysis. If Twitter finds you talking about a, del a deleted tweet in a conference paper, and they know the tweet was deleted before the paper was written, you could find yourself in a rather precarious position. Now, unfortunately, I don't have time to go into other issues, such as the fact that a user's location field is mostly useless, only 1% of users geocode their tweets on average, uh, popular tweets uh, don't appear popular when they're generated, it's only at the end of an event when you can determine what's been popular and what's been not. Uh, you have to go looking for those tweets after you've uh, finished your data collection. Uh, and you often, users often don't use built-in mechanisms to retweet or reply to other tweets, which then breaks uh, Twitter's API-based means of tracing conversations, then forcing you to use heuristics to do that, uh, and so on. So in a word, working with Twitter data is challenging, and your only hope uh, for working with it is to know your data inside and out. All right, so now what I'd do, like to do is to uh, discuss Epic Collect, which is the software that we use to um, uh, collect data at scale. And as I mentioned, I'm going to take you on a journey because uh, our journey uh, revolves around one word, and that word is failure. And I've discovered that the best motto for people who want to work with big data in the design of data-intensive systems is to embrace failure because you're going to fail a lot. Uh, but these failures almost always drive progress, and that progress eventually produces success. So we started, as I suspect many people do, with curl scripts, hitting the Twitter API and storing the response to a file. And this is great for small collections and works with both the streaming and search APIs, and is indeed the fastest way to get started on crisis informatic research. But don't do this. It is not scalable, it's not flexible, and it's not sustainable. You simply run into too many problems when you go down this path. So, for instance, uh, there's just, you know, there's, always, there's even just, you know, the newbie systems and sysadmin uh, problems of starting a collection on your laptop in your office and then forgetting that it's running and killing the collection as soon as you shut down your laptop. So you then log in to a server in your environment, and you run it there, uh, starting the collection. Oh, okay, so, so then you log into a server in your environment and run it there, and then realize that you can't log out without killing the collection. So you wise up, and you put the collection in the background, You put the collection in the background, you then log out, and you discover when you return that the shell helpfully killed that process when you logged out. So, and then you learn about things like terminal multiplexers, like screen or tmux, uh, and you finally, you can get the script running uh, when you're not logged in, but then the first network hiccup kills the collection anyway, or you get lucky, uh, and your script stays up for a long time, and then you run out of disk space.
And so the point is that no one wants to live this way. Um, so you get wise, and you move to actually using a database on a machine with lots of disk space, and you use a relational database because they're easy to use, and many of them are free. But, hmm, you need a schema, and wow, there sure is a lot of attributes that Twitter has on this tweet. And oh, look at that embedded user object that contains an embedded tweet object that has an embedded user object. Oh, well, we don't need all this stuff, so we'll just add columns that we're interested in, put those values in the database for each tweet, and throw the rest of the tweet away. And that works great for a while uh, until your analysts ask if they could start querying by one of the columns that you're so casually throwing away. And uh, what do you mean you don't have the information for the, all the tweets that we've collected? I thought you were storing the data. So in setting that issue aside, you are instead trucking along at about one or two tweets per second from the Twitter streaming API. And then a major event happens and you add terms uh, for that event and discover that you now have hundreds of tweets per second coming in, about 8.6 million tweets per day. And hum, that's weird. Our log is showing that our database is scrolling way down because it's trying to uh, index the tweets while storing them. And now there's tens of thousands of tweets in our in-memory, non-persistent queue that are just sitting there not being persisted. And now we're not processing the stream fast enough, so Twitter closes our collection, and then our power goes out. <laughs> So in this domain, you're just going to uh, discover that failures are hiding everywhere. And it can make Twitter data collection pretty stressful uh, with uh, your engineers on your team waiting up at night, uh, staring at log files streamed by anxiously. And so with this as backdrop, Project Epic needed to figure out how to get data collection to be reliable, scalable, and efficient. In other words, we needed it to become boring and not something that has to be thought about every waking moment. And that, I'm thankful to report, is where Project Epic is now. So how did we do it? Our approach to solving the collection problem was finding the right data store. And this was not a case of picking the most popular data store. Instead, it was understanding our requirements and then finding the persistence technology that met those needs exactly. We needed flexibility so that when Twitter changes its metadata, our data store doesn't care. We needed scalability since we never delete data sets. We have about two terabytes of data so far, and that's not going away. It's just going to continue to grow. We needed availability so that there's always at least one machine available to accept the tweet and persist it. And we needed reliability. Once Twitter hands us a tweet, it's up to us to make sure that we don't lose it because it could be very difficult or expensive to go back and find that tweet again. So we want to make sure that when we store that tweet as soon as possible, and we have it automatically replicated, so if one of our servers goes down or a disk fails on us, we're assured not to lose any data. And working back in 2010 and 2011, the technology that met those needs was Cassandra. It's a columnar no SQL data store that offers high availability, horizontal scalability, automatic replication, and a flexible data model. Cassandra is designed to run on a cluster of machines. It can accept a read or write request on any server, providing high availability, if you need more disk space, just add another server. All data is replicated, so if a disk or node goes down, you still have access to all your data. And Cassandra's data model is essentially a multi-level distributed hash table that can store anything from movies, as Netflix does, to tweets, as we do. At CU, our setup looks like this. We have a four-node Cassandra cluster that serves as our authoritative data source for all data sets. We have one server that hosts the Epic Event Editor, uh, and when we create a new event or make an update to an existing event, all we do is update a column family in Cassandra that stores information about all these events, and a second machine has the actual collection software on it. If we zoom in on Epic Collect, uh, we find that it's a fairly complicated uh, piece of software, which, which is implemented using multiple threads. A thread on that machine is in charge of monitoring the event column family, uh, looking for changes. Uh, and triggering re, uh, reconnections to the Twitter streaming API uh, if there's a change in that. Another thread is responsible for managing our connection to Twitter. Uh, it computes the same set of active keywords and submits them to Twitter. As, Twitter, as tweets stream in, these thread, another thread takes each tweet and adds it to an in-memory uh, queue. And then we have a suite of, three, of threads that are monitoring that queue, pulling tweets off of them, performing metrics, logging the tweets to a data file, and saving the tweets to Cassandra. And we finally have one additional thread that's used to monitor the connection to Twitter and the progress of the worker threads, restarting things uh, if it detects any problem. 
And with Cassandra, the biggest challenge is designing the row key that's used to store data in column family. Row keys determine where data is stored on the cluster and what gets replicated on the cluster. Each row key can be associated with any number of columns, and each column is a key value pair. You need your row keys to be grounded in the application domain for easy lookup and retrieval, and you want to design them such that the rows do not get too wide or too narrow, corresponding in our case to too many tweets on a particular row or too few. For our tweets, we use a compound row key that stores data in the following way, keyword, Julian date, and tag. And for any individual key, that means the tweet stored in this row contains this particular keyword and were collected on this day. Now the tag represents the bucket. And for each keyword day combination, we have 16 buckets. And we generate that tag by taking an MD5 hash of the entire JSON object uh, and taking the last digit of that hash. And then we store that tweet in that bucket. What this means is if we've collected a million tweets for a given keyword on a given day, we will have produced 16 different row keys in Cassandra, each containing about 62,000 tweets. And Cassandra would ensure that these rows would then spread evenly across the cluster. And this is much better than trying to store a single row of a million tweets on just one node of the cluster. And the reason for that is that Cassandra replicates rows. Uh, so when it replicates a row of tweets from one node to another, we get better performance if that row is, is smaller than if it has millions of tweets uh, in it, for instance. Now, if we didn't make use of our tag-based approach, we would see decreased performance from Cassandra because all tweets for a given keyword day combination might end up on a single node and then replicated to just one other node. And you could have, therefore, many nodes in your cluster just sitting idly uh, while two nodes melt down under the load. But with our tag-based approach, we evenly distribute the load across the cluster, both for the primary rows and their replicas, as shown here, and this helps to keep the cluster effectively used and leads to better performance. And here's an example of uh, our data collection from the 2015 Nepal earthquake, where one of our keywords was Nepal, and as you can see, we collected 750,000 tweets for the keyword during the first day of that event. But as you can also see here, those tweets were fairly evenly split across all 16 buckets and were thus evenly spread out across our, our cluster. When these rows were replicated, it was easier to perform that replication on rows of 47,000 tweets than it was on one big row of 750,000 tweets. So in this way, Cassandra met our needs perfectly. Its data model is flexible. We just store the entire JSON object that we get back from Twitter. We don't throw anything away, and we don't care if Twitter changes things on us. It's scalable because it's horizontally scalable. If we need more disk space, we just add another node, and Cassandra rebalances everything for you automatically. Cassandra provides high availability. You can read and write from any node, and Cassandra will figure out where things should go and replicate it. Uh, it's reliable because of the replication. If we ever, if we would need in our current configuration three of our servers to go down at once before we were in a situation where we couldn't proceed with data collection in a reliable way. So Cassandra was a lifesaver for our project, and now data collection is indeed mostly boring, which is a good thing. With Epic Analyze, now that we have a good handle on Epic Collect, let's look at Epic Analyze, because when you have two billion tweets flying around, you want to put them to good use. With Epic Analyze, we of course started with a constraint that all of our data is stored in Cassandra for the reasons that I just outlined. So when designing Epic Analyze, we needed to find a set of technology choices that would play nice with Cassandra. Our requirements for our data analysis environment were the following. We must first and foremost provide functionality that is central to the analysis domain, browsing, searching, sampling, filtering, sorting, processing, and annotating large data sets. We need to be able to provide this functionality while being efficient, such that most user requests can be processed at interactive speeds. Our system has to be scalable so that we can analyze Twitter data sets consisting of hundreds of millions of tweets, and it has to be extensible so that our users can supply their own algorithms to process entire data sets in some desired manner. And our data sets should be visible uh, to the user in a variety of ways, including charts, dashboards, and reports. And finally, our system needs to support interoperability the ability to export data sets for analysis and other tools, and the ability to create new data sets based on transforming existing data. data. Now, this is more recent work. We just started publishing papers on Epic Analyze uh, this year, and so we're not completely done, but let me give you some insight into where we are at and where we are going. 
Most of the features of Epic Analyze can be accessed via the main part of its user interface, uh, which we call the dataset browser. Most of the, data set, uh, most of the space of this user interface is devoted to the display of tweets, uh, highlighted here, um, that match a particular query, which is highlighted in green. That's uh, actually the result uh, saying that a query has, uh, in this case, about 300,000 results. Uh, each tweet is displayed in a compact form showing its user avatar, if present, screen name, the text of the tweet, and the date and time it was created. This compact representation also displays the number of comments that our analysts have made on it and any tags that they've associated with it. Comments and tags are not part of the original tweet, but rather annotations that our analysts can add to the tweet as they work with the data set. At the right-hand side of the compact representation is an edit button that brings up the annotation user interface. A user can click on a tweet and have all of its metadata displayed in a panel that slides into view under the compact form of the tweet, uh, shown here. At the top of the browsing window is a visualization of the currently selected set of tweets that displays the volume of tweets over time. When a data set is initially opened, it shows the entire collection, but as you can see here, we can drag uh, and select just a certain portion of that uh, data set, and then all of our queries and visualizations update to the new selected time range. The filtering interface is on the left and consists of an area on top that displays the current query and the number of tweets that each filter produces in the context of that uh, query, uh, if any. And then below that is a set of controls that allows additional queries to be specified across the majority of the metadata associated with a tweet or the user who generated it. Here's a shot of what that filtering interface looks like in a previous version of the software. The current interface is similar but more compact. But however, this image gives a sense for the types of attributes we can search on, things like when it was created, uh, the keywords that were used, the hashtags it contains, when did the user join Twitter, all of those things. At the top of the interface is a menu bar where the analyst has additional options. For instance, once an analyst has produced a smaller data set that contains tweets of interest for a particular research question, they can export that so that it uh, plays into third-party tools. Uh, and they can also uh, give that, sub that, that smaller data set a new name um, so they can just go directly to that smaller data set in subsequent analysis um, uh, sessions. And so those are the primary features that Epic Anal uh, Anal Analyze provides to our analysts. And so how did we do this? We did it through our system's architecture. The architecture for Epic Analyze builds on top of Epic Collect's uh, storage mechanism, Cassandra, via the use of a package called Data Stack Enterprise, uh, which provides integrated versions of Solar, Pig, Hadoop, and Hive. Uh, each of these components can be used to help index, search, or process the large Twitter data sets that we've stored in Cassandra. Postgres is used to store the annotations that our analysts make. Uh, and Epic Analyze itself is implemented as a Ruby on Rails web application that knows how to access all the infrastructure that's uh, located below uh, in response to user queries. We make use of Redis to, uh, for instance, cache the results of frequently accessed queries and data. And here I, don't, I can't talk about it, but we've also integrated the third-party data analysis tool Splunk, so we've been making good on our interoperability goals as well. Um, now, not shown in this architecture diagram is the fact that we have a, a job processing system that's built into Epic Analyze uh, that allows users and developers to plug in their own code that can then be applied to the data sets that we have uh, in, uh, our, in Cassandra. And we've used this job uh, processing framework ourselves to help sort all of our data sets so that users can click on various attributes and have data sets sorted in that way. Now, before I go on to talk about the future of crisis informatics research and our, our future goals for our infrastructure, let me just pause real quick for the uh, implications uh, of everything that I've shown uh, so far, because um, there's some pretty serious software engineering implications behind the design of these two systems. The design of data-intensive systems for crisis informatics and for uh, application domains in general is indeed a challenging task. It forces developers to abandon many of the techniques that they were taught when they first started programming. Single-threaded applications running on a single machine, 
supporting the interactive editing of a small amount of data. It takes you from a centralized mode model of computing to cluster computing, a single-threaded view of computation to parallelism and concurrency. Interactive systems are nice, but many jobs in a, data system, in a big data system are long-lived and have to be processed via batch processing. Stream processing can reduce the time to calculate results, but adds all the challenges of real time and requires a steep learning curve to get right. And finally, rather than the comforting norms of relational databases, schemas, normalization, and transactions, we have to abandon what we know and instead move to NoSQL systems that have flexible data models but contain duplicated data, don't have schemas, and have to deal with something known as eventual consistency, since our data is being stored on multiple servers that might live in more than one data center. So a meta challenge here is that a developer in this space isn't being asked to learn just one of these unfamiliar areas of computing, but all of them. So if you start working in this space, get ready. It's fun, you're gonna learn a lot, but it is hard. And remember to embrace failure and keep making progress towards a solution that meets your need in an iterative fashion. All right, and with that, that's the current state of our software infrastructure, along with some insight into why it's so challenging to work in this space. But I promised you a look at what's next as well. There are two concerns to talk about with respect to the future of crisis informatics, uh, functionality and software architecture. With respect to functionality, my colleague, Leisha Palin, gave a talk back at CHI 2015 as part of receiving the CHI Social Impact Award for her work in this area. And she talked about where she sees crisis informatics research going in the future. And she identified a wide range of concerns, including the four listed here. And let's look at a few of these. A lot of work in crisis informatics, ours included, uh, back when we first started, has used the tweet as the unit of analysis. But we've discovered that a single tweet is too limiting if you want to find interesting behavior. For instance, consider this tweet taken from our Hurricane Sandy data set. The ship is out of control. I feel like I'm going to see a deer flying in the sky. Now, if you use standard analysis techniques, you might be asked, um, does this tweet make any sense at all? Is this tweet relevant? Yes or no? And it certainly doesn't stand on its own. But if you look at this tweet in the context of all of this user's other tweets, a story emerges. People are really overacting about this damn hurricane. I'm about to put my iPhone on the charger, the, the tweet I read previously. Uh, I'm about to make something to eat before the power goes out. And then a long time later, Governor Christie, when is it safe again to head back home? Uh, and finally, it feels so good to be home. And so now, with all these tweets, it becomes clear that this is a person who decided to evacuate even though at the beginning of the event they were openly disdainful for how people were reacting to the presence of Hurricane Sandy. Uh, and he did this, he, he, he evacuated without ever using the word evacuate in his tweets. More importantly, we only found this user via our contextual collection because he contributed just a single tweet to our keyword collection, the one shown in blue. That tweet happened to be geotagged as well, which is why he was included in the contextual collection. Anyway, in the future, we'll need to develop techniques that can look for meaning within sets of tweets, either within a single user's tweets, as shown here, or among sets of tweets that consist of conversations between one or more users. And uh, for sake of time, I'm going to have to skip over some of the other uh, things that Leisha talked about in that talk, just so I can talk about the software architecture uh, part of our work and where we're, where we're going to be taking that. So to uh, make progress on the new class of functionality, we need to make changes to our software architecture. Uh, and the key driver that is um, driving those changes is the need for real-time collection and analysis. Project Epic is currently set up to capture data in a scalable and reliable fashion, but we analyze our data well after an event is over. What can we do on the architecture side to move to real-time data analysis? And that's what I'm currently working on. And I'm taking a deep look at some of the frameworks shown here, Storm, uh, Spark, Drill, and Helix, uh, with the main theme behind these being uh, the ability to do more at the point of data collection. Don't just store tweets as they stream in, but index them in various ways in parallel, update running averages, compute metrics for various windows of time, as well as on the entire data set and ensure that all the nodes in your cluster are being effectively utilized at least 99% of the time. 
In looking at enabling real-time analysis at scale, I'm back to this situation. Based on my initial work so far, perhaps uh, my new architecture might be Spark on top of Cassandra, but it's simply too early to say if this will be successful. Um, I'm also looking at uh, what are known as concurrency frameworks uh, that are starting to appear in many side-by-side uh, -side with new programming languages. Uh, many novel concurrency frameworks are now available that make it very easy to specify a set of tasks, spin up workers across many nodes of a cluster, and distribute the tasks to those workers as needed. This is certainly what Spark does, but it's also a feature of things like Elixir, uh, which is a language that's building on top of Erlang, uh, and uh, which has been used in the telecommunication industry for a long time to create highly parallel distributed software systems. So I think it might be interesting, for instance, to look at an approach to collection that involves a lot of small processes balanced across a cluster of machines. If one of these processes detects something interesting, say a user whose follower count is shooting way up over a short amount of time, it can spin up a data collection on just that user alone, or might spin up another collection that establishes a geofence around that user and collects all the geotag tweets that emerge from that location. Uh, and it might kick off a long-term crawl of that user's friends and followers graph to see what community that user is um, uh, uh, a part of. And all these are things that we do currently weeks or sometimes months after the initial data collection. But with things like Elixir, there might be an opportunity to... Uh, you know, create thousands of these tasks across, you know, uh, tens of uh, machines and be able to do this type of analysis in real time. So with that, I hope you can see I think our future is bright. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity to work on problems and topics that will help to produce the next generation of crisis informatics software systems. It'll take a lot of work, but it should produce new algorithms to tackle some of the new types of functionality that I discussed, and we will need to first design then build and finally test new candidate software architectures to see if we can perform advanced collection and analysis in real time as crisis events unfold. I think it's an interesting time for performing research in crisis informatics and in big data, and I hope I've given you insight into what it takes to develop software infrastructure that is capable of handling the challenges found in this domain. As we move to handling real-time analysis and architecting systems capable of providing even more insights into mass emergency events, I think it increases our ability to perform research that has a tangible impact, helping people during times of mass emergency and increasing society's ability to respond to these events and be resilient to their efforts over time. So please join me in making that happen. Thanks very much for your time and attention, and I am happy to listen to your comments and respond to your questions. Thanks very much. Thank you, Professor Anderson. So there are a couple of questions that I'm going to ask real quick. The first question is about Epic Collect. And with Epic Collect, you utilize Cassandra for your data storage, and you also discuss the importance of good row key design. Many researchers in other domains are actually starting to deal with large data sets. So my question is, do you believe that the solution you have found in your particular domain is applicable to other domains, or was there something very specific about the data that comes from Twitter that allows your solution to work so well? Right. So yes, the, uh, the meta issue there is data modeling in general. And I like to say that data modeling is wicked hard. That's uh, the one East Coast phrase that I've adopted in my life and use uh, uh, frequently. Um, and so it comes down to data modeling. And the, the key insight there is how do you create row keys that will allow you to express queries that you're interested in? So when we go and, and get data out of Cassandra, we're always interested in uh, our, our unit of analysis is always the event. And so we keep track of what keywords did we um, uh, collect on what days. And so then when we go back to Cassandra, we say, hey, I need all the tweets for this keyword on this day and this day, and we can give it a range of days. And so our row key design is optimized for that query. And then we use Hadoop and other things to uh, do more fine-grained analysis. So, while, uh, the, so, so the technique I showed here of saying what is it about your application domain and what is it that you're querying, that generalizes across application domains to other, research, uh, uh, other researchers. And then this notion of needing the tag to help make sure that you're not 
sending all of your row, uh, all of your uh, columns to the same node in the cluster, that is also a useful and generic technique that can go across uh, many different application domains. The key thing there is that if you don't understand how Cassandra uses row keys to partition data across um, uh, the cluster, you can end up using Cassandra in a way that it wasn't designed and can get sub subpar performance. So our particular row key won't be useful to other people, but those lessons learned about what you need to have in the row key and this, this notion of using tags that will help you know, uh, split your data into buckets, that's also very useful. And then the larger issue across multiple data stores is that you, when you move into this space, you really have to be, you really have to have full attention on your data modeling choices. If you collect you know, terabytes of data and you discover you got your data model wrong, it's a very, very painful situation where you then have to get more terabytes of disk space available and then reformat to the data model that would answer your question. And so that's the, the basic response there. Okay, thank you very much. Our next question is asking, how do you distinguish when the same hashtag is actually used for more than one event simultaneously? And has this ever come up when you analyzed previous events? Yes, um, so that's correct. And, and like one of the, uh, uh, one of our fun stories is on earthquakes. So we tend to hear about uh, the big earthquakes and we'll go back and say, hey, so on that uh, day it was the, Ch the Chile earthquake, let's collect all those tweets and start looking at them. And then sure enough, uh, those tweets are talking about, you know, the, the, could be talking about the 100 to 200 earthquakes that happen every day. <laughs> so what's interesting about the hashtag for earthquake is that it's a uh, high signal. People rarely use the hashtag earthquake and not uh, talk about, uh, and be talking about something else. Um, but there just happens to be a lot of earthquakes every day that don't make the news. Uh, and so you do have to do a uh, disambiguation uh, that way. And so, yes, what we do is that uh, when tweets come in, the Epic Collect just knows what keywords are currently um, of interest. And so basically takes all the events that we've stored in the Epic Event Editor and unions all of the terms, and that's what gets submitted to Twitter. So when it comes in, a, a tweet comes in with a particular hashtag, all it is, all it does is store that tweet into the uh, row key as I, was, as, as I showed. And so then what we have to do during analysis is for when we're studying one event versus another, then we have to start applying filters. Oh, this, this keyword showed up in three events that were active that time. Here are some keywords that we, we can use to filter out the tweets from that event while still seeing the tweets that contain that hashtag in this event. So yes, you're, we basically, our approach is to push that off into filtering uh, downstream during the analysis phase. And of course, another thing that comes up as well is that a tweet comes in and has multiple things that are uh, matching the, the keywords that we are um, uh, interested in. So it might have two hashtags that we're monitoring and one word that we're monitoring. And what our Epic Collect does is it stores that tweet three times in three separate rows. And that's one of the things about the NoSQL world is there's no attempt to really keep uh, just a single copy of the tweet. We duplicate as needed, and then later on we're querying by, by keyword, and so we'll see that, that tweet each time in each of those contexts um, uh, when we're studying them at a keyword level. All right, thank you very much. I'm afraid we've run out of time today. So I'd like to thank Professor Anderson again for his informative presentation and his insightful answers to these questions. Special thanks to each of you for taking the time to attend and participate in today's webinar. This webinar was recorded and will be available online in a few days at www.sigsoft.org slash resources slash webinars.html. You can find announcements on upcoming ACM and SIGSOFT webinars and other ACM activities at learning.acm.org and at www.sigsoft.org. That said, this is Robert Dyer saying goodbye for now. Thanks again for joining us, and I hope you will join us again in the future. Yep, thank you.